Hello, everyone. This is Brent Pritt with the Science of Falling podcast. This is going to be episode number three. I have a special guest today with us, Mike Pisani. And we met back in, what was it, Boston, I believe, Boston area, for a foot collective seminar. And he's a great guy. Um, I'm going to throw it over to him, introduce himself, and tell us a little more about, about him. Thank you, Brent. Uh, yes, I am Mike Pisani. I'm a personal trainer. Um, I kind of consider myself more of a a movement coach or a movement guide, although those terms have been stigmatized a little bit. Um, yeah, we met up in New England. I'm living up here originally from the Philly area. And uh, yeah, I'm, a, I'm an exerciser. I'm a runner. I help people move better. I help people restore their foot health when I'm working with the Foot Collective. And I'm just fascinated by all things movement and learning and natural living. I love it. I love it. And talk about the Foot Collective, you're a proclaimed, not self-proclaimed, you are a certified foot nerd, right? Is that, is that what they're still calling it? Or is it, they changed it, didn't they? So we were considering changing it to health nerd. That's what it um, was. But we are actually sticking with foot nerd to kind of not necessarily stay on brand, but to honor the fact that foot, like the foot is really the foundation of the work that we're doing there. Mm -hmm. uh, but yes, I was a part of the inaugural class of foot nerds. Uh, which allows me to help people on a formal basis as well as help out chief foot nerds with seminars and workshops and things like that. Sweet. And that's actually how we met. You were helping out at the seminar. Not You weren't part of the seminar. You were actually teaching and you had a lot of you know good info to, to give. And that's yeah, kind of part of the I was, reason I want, want you on the podcast. Thank you. Yeah, I was definitely doing a lot of learning. Like that was actually my first time meeting Nick, who's the, the dude who started, one of the guys who started the Foot Collective. And he's just extremely knowledgeable, extremely passionate, extremely articulate. So I was able to throw some things in there, but I was doing a ton of learning that day. Hey, we all start, start somewhere, right? That's what I'm doing with this podcast. I'm learning as I go and I'm going to learn a lot from you today. And hopefully the, anybody who listens to this learns a lot as well. So you being a foot nerd, tell me a little bit about the foot, uh, the optimal foot, like the state of the foot nowadays, kind of wherever your brain takes us to start that off. Man, the, the state of the foot is, uh, it's, it's kind of bleak at the moment. Um, historically, feet have gone through some pretty terrible times. Um, it's interesting how humans have kind of subjected other humans or themselves into these weird foot practices and positions, um, like foot binding being probably the most noteworthy, terrible example. Um, but we're kind of doing something similar with our feet today. Mm -hmm. So I guess the basic premise I would want people to understand is that the natural human foot looks a little bit, or in some cases, much different from the traditional, normal Western feet that you might see if you look down at your own feet. And the ideal foot or the natural foot would be, in my words, just a, a natural foot that has the toes splayed out a little bit, kind of like your fingers would be. Mm -hmm. uh, the big toe would be abducted. So it would be pulled away from the other toes slightly. Um, and all of us would have some sort of an arch, whether it was high or medium or low, none of us would really have flat feet. And a lot of that, most of that dysfunction comes from improperly designed footwear. Would you say, so I know a lot of people would say like bunions, you know, the, the abducted big toe can be genetic and whatnot but it was so from what you're saying right now is a lot of those kind of things are more from footwear forcing us in these positions like the the foot binding but at a lesser degree like what's is that kind of what you're saying that's exactly what i'm saying um i think how we and this is something that at the foot collective we talk about and nick is a big believer in and if we dig into the research we would probably find a lot of this as well is that bunions can be familial but they are not really genetic. Mm -hmm. And so for a lot of us, our parents had bunions, maybe our grandparents had bunions. Usually, I mean, usually bunions didn't exist when we had more natural footwear. So mm -hmm. probably prior to the 1950s or 1940s, um, before we started really manipulating the shoe in different ways for fashion purposes or whatever, mm -hmm. uh, we didn't really see bunions. Uh, and your bunions, or if you, if you have bunions, you would not have them if you were using natural footwear. If you do have them, this is what's cool if your listeners are afflicted with foot dysfunction, is your bunions can go away 99% of the time without surgical intervention. Yeah, super interesting. So this is something I've thought about. So you said they're familial, but not necessarily, that doesn't mean you necessarily get it. So is that in terms of like 
habits that you get from your parents or the type of shoes they get you in as a kid and then all of a sudden like the adidas or something become your favorite type of shoe and they form your foot in a certain way i mean i, I said adidas but i mean that could be any shoe or brand i don't mean to you know take them out but no, no disrespect to adidas <laughs> no uh yeah that's what i'm saying so like the the practices of your family uh we know has a, a massive effect on your health maybe one of the biggest effects um, children who come from obese parents tend to be obese. Um, people with uh, metabolic dysfunction, if, if their parents had that, it's, chances are they are more likely to end up with metabolic dysfunction. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the same is true with bunions and plantar fasciitis, and actually in my case, ingrown toenails, which is something we could, we could talk about as well. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's, let's start at the top of, so what are shoes, and break it down, what are shoes doing to our feet? You know, like what is the what is the ideal shoe and what are shoes that we normally wear now kind of showing us? Yeah. So I guess I'll start with what, what the ideal shoe would be. Um, so it, it would be wide. It would be wide in the forefoot. So where your toes are uh, through the toe box, I guess if, if we're using like mm -hmm. shoe terminology, it's wide enough that there could be space in between your toes for your, your toes to spread out. So they would be wider. They would be what is called zero drop, which is a term created by, the footwear industry. So that's kind of another issue with footwear is that mm -hmm. we've created terminology that can be confusing to the consumer. Zero drop just means your shoe is totally flat. The heel, there's no elevated heel. So it would be Which, totally flat. Yeah. Uh, it, they, it, oh, sorry to interrupt. I was thinking it's interesting because I think most people think their footwear's flat. Yeah, probably. Um, or at least partially. I mean, yeah. what's interesting about culture today is the shoes are just insane. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's a total extreme version of a shoe where there is a prominent rigid heel lift. Um, so today it's like harder and harder to deny that, uh, the, the shoes are, are not natural. Yeah. Um, it's a lot of young people wearing the shoes. So those problems may not manifest as injuries for a few years or maybe, maybe months. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, some people think they're probably in, in flat footwear. So basically when you're in a, a proper pair of shoes, your heel would be at the same level as your toes. That would be a zero drop shoe. Um, they should also be flexible. So, uh, they, you know, the, if, if, if you needed to like twist your foot or if you were to extend your big toe, that movement should be able to be reflected in the shoe. Mm -hmm. And generally, we believe they should also be pretty thin. So you shouldn't have too much cushioning. Um, I would say that the thin, the thinness or the thickness of your sole, there's a little bit more flexibility there. Uh, in my opinion, as someone who doesn't just walk and work as someone who does other athletic pursuits. Mm -hmm. uh, but those characteristics are what we would want to see. So modern shoes are too narrow in the toe box. A lot of them have an elevated heel. A lot of them have a ton of cushioning. And most of them are very rigid, even if they are advertised or marketed as like an athletic shoe. A lot of them are, they lack flexibility. Yeah, so I know, I don't know how much of the history of shoes is kind of, you know, stuck in your brain, but where did that, all that stuff come from? Like, I mean, because I was doing, I'm doing another article right now. I just released the Optimal Foot article I did. I don't know if you read that one at all, mm, no, but I'm doing uh, another article about, part of it's a little bit about the history of shoes. And, you know, there's, we found some leather shoes 5,500 years ago, I think it was, mm -hmm. that, you know, were the modern because they're using leather and it has a tie on the top but they look pretty foot shaped. And then mm -hmm. there's a pair of like, I think rope sandals about 10,000 years ago, which is the oldest pair of shoes I think we can, we found. Um, and then again, I mean, that's letting the toes splay out and everything. Where did we go wrong in the history? And when, when did we start adding in all this cushioning and all this crazy stuff we think is good for our feet, but obviously it doesn't seem very logical. Yeah. So I guess I'll start, um, with what I would consider maybe like a lower, lower level problem is that I guess Nike kind of created a redesigned more, uh, more narrow shoe. And then mm -hmm. shortly after that, they started adding the elevated heel. I think that was in the, between the fifties or the sixties, possibly the seventies. So really recently then that's really recent as far as yeah. like Western American culture is concerned. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think that, kind of coalesced with, um, there was a book that came out that I think was just titled Jogging, which was talking about the health benefits of jogging. Uh, and I believe it was advocating for heel striking, which the author was uh, claiming was less injurious and mm -hmm. more sustainable for the average person. And that's when we started to see this, the jogging and running trend uh, increase. 
And I think we didn't see all of the, the repercussions of that until the last decade or two. Mm -hmm. um, you know, prior to that, I would probably argue that the introduction of more like formal or fancy wardrobes or ways of living were problematic, not only for shoes, but also just for how humans interacted, right? Creating like mm -hmm. societal hierarchies, um, which caused a lot of problems, uh, caused a lot of problems over the course of history. But uh, when we started to create uh, clothing and shoes that would differentiate one class or whatever of people from another, um, a lot of those things were harmful or mm -hmm. not necessarily natural in terms of wardrobe design. Mm -hmm. But I, I couldn't necessarily say when, when that was. Oh, for sure, for sure. But I mean, like you said at the very beginning, shoes at one point were very natural. They were just, you know, coverings for the feet to protect you from getting whatever, you know, cut or something when you're running around the forest. But at some point we turn them into fashion and all these other things that kind of lead to bad things happening in the long term to our foot health. So what do we, how do we kind of, you know, re-steer this, this direction we're going in? How do we get to an optimal shoe or foot, however you want to Bring it. You know, I, I guess it, it's initially starting here with like the sharing of information, what we might call educating people. Um, that's actually a term that, you know, through discussing with Jeff, the urban barefoot, a guy who I've learned a lot from and Nick from the Foot Collective, like we're really trying to reframe um, like how we talk about how we talk about certain things, whether it comes to anatomy or movement or even just health heuristics as it's put by the foot collective. But when we say education, sometimes that creates something that differentiates like the instructor from the person who is learning or the student. Um, mm -hmm. So I personally really like to frame it as just sharing information mm -hmm. because if I'm just sharing information, then that means like there is room for someone to ask questions and push back and demand that uh, a stance be reinforced more. It's mm -hmm. not like I'm, giving you this information that, that I have. It's like, I'm just, we're just sharing. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it starts with sharing, like you and a lot of other people and myself, I didn't know that bunions, A, don't ever need to really exist anatomically, and B, can be uh, remedied through non-surgical interventions. Mm -hmm. So I think just letting people know some of these facts, like that plantar fasciitis, if you are diagnosed with that or a doctor tells you that it doesn't mean you need to take a pill or you need to have a surgery it basically means there's inflammation which we can alleviate through a bunch of different health practices or health routines that an individual can do by themselves mm -hmm. so i think it starts with empowering people that they can change and modify the pain or the sensations they're feeling right now um, and then i think it's going to take some redesign of footwear so big footwear, Nike, Adidas, all these big companies, I think they make more than 17 or $18 billion a year, pardon me, yeah. uh, which has been impacted by the recent pandemic, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, but that is a gargantuan, massive industry. And they are making most of their footwear improperly, in my opinion. So there's going to need to be a redesign. Fortunately, a lot of companies now are designing footwear in ways that we consider more natural. Mm -hmm. Vivo barefoot being one of them, earth runner sandals being another, which is funny. Like it's not even really a redesign. It's kind of a return back to natural design. Yeah. It just um, seems like it was a natural progression that should have came way before any of this other stuff. Like where did we, yeah, was, my brain's like, at what point did we just deviate from this thing that looked like a foot to something that looked nothing like a foot. And we thought was acceptable culturally. Cause now I think if you wear um, like the Vibrams and stuff, people give you weird looks because now all of a sudden it's like, Oh, why does your foot look like a foot now? That's strange. I don't understand what's going on. Yeah. I don't think any like shoe has been stigmatized negatively more than the Vibram five yeah. finger shoe. Um, and I had a pair and you know, I, I didn't even wear them that much because you know, I got weird looks and yeah. not because I was ashamed, but personally I'm someone who doesn't like to draw a lot of attention to myself. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's, that's actually another important thing that's happening with footwear now is that companies are making shoes that I think society would agree look relatively cool. Mm -hmm. So like the Vivo barefoot shoes look really cool. Like when I wear them to the gym or just walking around town, people will ask me, 
what they are because they look cool, but people can also tell that they look a little bit different. Mm -hmm. So I think that's actually a really important shift in my mind as someone that's just wanting what's best for everyone. Like it's a little frustrating that that is such an important factor that something has to look cool enough to be accepted. Uh, but as someone who's trying to like, you know, hammer the point home and help people, I understand that that might be one of the biggest impact, especially for these younger people that are engaging in athletics and exercising and living their lives. And they're really only going to wear something that is considered cool. So that's ongoing at the moment. It's just so interesting how the, just the, the brain and the culture, you know, all these societal pressures literally let you mess up something like your feet even though you wear the shoes and oftentimes you feel the, the pressure, the rubbing between your feet, you feel sore after a long day, you want to kick them off. Whereas you can just wear something that's a little bit wider, maybe a little bit not as cool, I guess would be the word and feel fantastic. It's, it's so strange to me. I agree. It is very strange to me. And I feel like that is how I would almost characterize my, um, my career, my experience with fitness is that I've always done what feels natural. So like earlier, I mentioned that I had some ingrown toenails Mm -hmm. and my mom had really bad ingrown toenails and uh, her big toenails were actually removed back, I think, in the 1980s because it was such a repeat issue for her. And, you know, she was someone who she actually worked in the footwear industry, um, kind of kind of unrelated to all this. But she used to like work as a buyer for women's shoes, Mm -hmm. like high heel shoes. And um when I started to get ingrown toenails when I was like 13 or 14, my mom was like, yeah, you know, it's genetic. Like I got them. Uh, I think my sister's got them. So I would go to the podiatrist. They would tell me, yep, you have ingrown toenails. They would cut it away. And then like six months later, the same thing would happen. And it wasn't until I, my sister actually gave me a pair of New Balance Minimus shoes, mm-hmm. one of the first versions, that they just stopped happening. And that's when I realized like, oh, these things – like I didn't really, I didn't realize like, oh, they're not genetic or that I didn't really understand, uh, you know, how, how genetic issues or familial issues yeah. worked at that point. But I, I realized like, oh, through an external change, like we can prevent a lot of these things. Mm-hmm. And that That's, was a really important point for me. Yeah. And I think it's, people need those subtle pivoting points where they're like, oh, I actually have power over this. And mm-hmm. it's really interesting to me that, taking back to the podiatrist who really didn't give you anything other than a bandaid for this, you know, the problem. And you know, me working in healthcare as a physical therapist, I see this. I mean, I've had one of my most recent patients that came in actually had some um, plantar fasciitis and the podiatrist sent him to us and said, give mm. him ultrasound, just ultrasound his foot, just, you mm. know, sound waves in there. It'll fix everything up. And it was so interesting. I'm like, the guy didn't talk to you about your shoes at all. He didn't talk to you about, you know, just, you know, working on your foot in general, the foot strength of it and, you know, stability of the leg. And like for people that are supposed to be, you know, foot experts, it's not that I don't want to hate on podiatrists. I'm saying it's, I think it's the, the culture of healthcare right now basically says use these band-aids, modalities, whatever it might be, because telling a person to walk barefoot more and strengthen the foot through natural exercises, you can give them a, literally a printout of things they can do. And they would be probably better within a couple of weeks and not have an issue. Um, it blows my mind every time I get a patient like that. And I actually feel guilty sometimes for, you know, treating these patients for a couple of weeks. And I'm like, man, you could have just did this on your own. And but I mean, I get it's a business, but it's just the culture of healthcare is driving me a little bad in that regard. I, I think, yeah, I think you're experiencing what I've experienced with a lot of like young uh, practitioners are experiencing in that. I think we all know that the healthcare uh, industry or whatever is, is broken in some ways. Mm -hmm. And a lot of us work in it, you know, like you're a physical therapist. I've worked at medically integrated fitness centers. Mm -hmm. And what is really cool about, I think our generation, um, is that we're all really enthusiastic about finding more natural, holistic, uh, just efficient solutions to things. And there is so much like bureaucracy and dogma in the medical field, unfortunately, that, we're, we're probably going to feel some sense of guilt for a few years to come until mm-hmm. there are big shifts. And it's really challenging, like philosophically, as people who work with, with humans on a medical or just an anatomical basis. Um, but what's really exciting to me is that there are practitioners like you 
who are going to foot collective events who are, mm-hmm. you know, I don't know, I don't know what other stuff you do, but I know a lot of like physical therapists and people in medical school who are getting into meditation, who are mm-hmm. getting into holotropic breath work, who are getting into cold exposure, cold plunging and things like that. Mm-hmm. And I, I really, as, as hard as it is right now, and with the negative experiences a lot of us have had going to these experts, really, I think a lot of them are just experts in how to perform surgery or um, to, to talk about maybe what they remembered from the textbooks, which is, I don't mean that disparagingly. I think the mm-hmm. way a lot of us were taught was not so efficient, having gone through an exercise physiology program myself. Mm-hmm. Um, so while things are maybe a little bleak or not so efficient right now, I think in the coming years and decade and decades, we're going to see a gigantic improvement in healthcare. And it's not because of the system necessarily, but it's because of all the practitioners who have a deep caring for their practice and for the people they work with. Mm -hmm. It's interesting um, talking about the health community and bringing it back to Nick from the Foot Collective. I don't know if you heard his recent podcast he did with Ryan DeBell on the movement fix. Uh, No, I didn't. No. So he he did a couple recently, obviously they're in, you know, everybody's in quarantine. So there's a lot more free time to, do those type of things but he actually was talking about it was interesting it wasn't so much about the foot it was more about the business side of the foot collective mm. and he was talking about how he actually let his licensure for being you know physiotherapist lapse because mm. he, he was like it's actually holding me back from helping people because i have to be within these confines of a physical therapist yeah. whereas if i let that go i no longer have to you know answer to you know the physiotherapy board in canada or whatever it might be it was such an interesting point of view and like you know, working as a physical therapist now, I get it. You're, there's a more red tape when you have a license like this than not because you still have the same knowledge. You just don't have this mm. monkey on your back telling you, oh, that's not what the medical system wants me to do, so I can't do it. Yeah, um, I, I think a lot of practitioners will probably start to, like, maybe start their own businesses. Like, I don't know, now is such a confusing time to start a business. I don't know what will happen, but this is something we see. Even, I, didn't, I met um, that physical therapist, Charlie Weingroff, back in the day. Mm-hmm. He used to come to the college I was uh, studying at, and he would, give, he would talk. Um, mm-hmm. And he was like, at least it seemed like an early physical therapist to give up like a formal, I, I think he kept his licensure, but he mm-hmm. just pretty much only started accepting cash. It's and okay. he, was, he was so good as a physical therapist practicing in New York City that he made far more money just just taking cash, not working with insurance providers in any way. Mm-hmm. And still, you know, still doing, I think, what would be considered traditional physical therapy in some ways, but by doing the things that he knew was best for the patients. So I'm not saying you guys don't do that. Mm-hmm. But like you were saying, there's often a lot of red tape. You have to, be, you know, take so many precautions. Uh, one of the things I feel like I always think about is these stories of people that are diagnosed with something who, you know, their doctor told them they would only, you know, I, they would never walk again, mm-hmm. or they wouldn't, they wouldn't live more than a year or two. And then we hear so many of these stories of people who absolutely walked and like ran a, a marathon, or mm-hmm. lived another 30 years. And I think part of that is that doctors fear the repercussions of like a lawsuit or something from maybe on the insurance side of things, if they give a really optimistic prognosis, and then it doesn't pan out the way they want. And no. it's kind of a, a shame that we, like they, and we cannot express our optimism more freely because as we know, like the placebo effect and mm-hmm. self-belief is such a gigantic part of recovery and growth that it's ultimately the, the patients and uh, the clients who are missing out from those like dark prognoses. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's so interesting to say that because that's been a thought. Even before I became a physical therapist, I was actually not a fan of the medical field because you do hear those stories a lot and it's, it's better for, from a lawsuit side to crush a patient's hope and dreams, everything they want. It's just more, it's safer for you it's to do safer. it as a, as a clinician than to yeah. say, you know what, there's a chance you might walk, you know, but then no one's going to do that. It's like, you're not going to walk again. Let's just call it. Cause if you get better, they can't get mad at you. All of a sudden it's a miracle versus having a potential, you know, non miracle recovery, but the doctor's never going to tell you that because it's too scary for them to get a lawsuit. Yeah, and that's just really horrific uh, with, with, you know, what we know about believing in, like, your chances or your opportunities to succeed or grow or recover, mm-hmm. that 
that we would revert to something that we know has detrimental effects psychologically and you know that no biological system operates independently of the other mm-hmm. so that has physical repercussions as well yeah so interesting so interesting well bringing it back to the foot so you know shoes are kind of putting our foot into these abnormal positions changing the way the foot works uh you know you talked a little bit about the optimal uh, type of footwear. So how do we get our foot back on track? So obviously change into optimal footwear, you know, helps, but it doesn't, it's not the whole story about getting back to optimal foot. So like, how do we get there? Yeah, it, it, it definitely depends on um, what you have going on specifically mm-hmm. to yourself. So if you have like terrible bunions and you've had one or multiple bunionectomies, um, you know, it it might be good to go see a podiatrist just because they are likely to be able to give you a really good understanding of what you do have going on. Mm -hmm. Um, Because there's so much complicated, not not complicated, but so much like dynamic, interesting stuff going on within the feet and within the hands, Mm -hmm. um, that it is worthwhile to go see an expert from time to time. Definitely. Um, But outside of really terrible situations, Uh, Being barefoot more often is the first thing we generally suggest. So when you're at home, be barefoot all the time. If you can walk around barefoot in your yard or in your garden or at the park, do that as well. Um, That is going to be something that will begin to build the intrinsic muscles of the feet if they have atrophied away from wearing improper footwear. Um, There are also going to be other benefits to that. If you're walking outside, you're going to be grounding and connecting with the earth, which has a whole host of Mm -hmm. physiological benefits. You're going to be outside, which is generally more beneficial than being inside. Um, And then if you are doing that, but you feel like you are unable to achieve much toe splay, you're going to want to try to figure that out. Um, The Foot Collective uh, sells what are called toe spreaders. Um, You could find those in in a few different places. So from the Mm -hmm. Foot Collective, you can find different versions on Amazon. Um, If you go to a running store or a foot health retailer in some way they might have something or if you don't want to go buy something which i'm usually in favor of yeah. you could literally just find anything that you could stick in between your toes for mm-hmm. anywhere from five minutes to five hours you know as long mm-hmm. as it's tolerable um, and then once your toes start to remain splayed out in the resting position uh, you'll probably start to develop a little bit of an arch especially if you are toe spreading in conjunction with barefoot walking and so if you have a little bit of an arch you have some splay in your toes, maybe from uh, barefoot walking, you've developed a little bit of like toughness to the, the skin of the bottom of your feet, then you're pretty much good to go. Your hardware is probably restored back to mm-hmm. 99% of what it needs to be. So simple. And that's, I mean, that's the part that always blows my mind is we try to complicate it in the metaphor world, like just walk barefoot and pay attention yeah. to what you're doing and don't cut your feet while you're out there and you're going to be solid. Like it doesn't take that yeah. much work. It is super simple and, you know, we could give much more complicated uh, answers like, you know, if you do have plantar fasciitis or just generalized pain on the bottom of your feet, you could roll your feet on something firm like a golf ball or a lacrosse ball or a frozen water bottle. Mm -hmm. Um, That would be like a form of myofascial um, release or massage. So that could be helpful. You could certainly get yourself like a more complicated toe spreading device and uh, a foot rolling specific device, but mm-hmm. um, I try to give the most basic examples I can because personally, I don't want to go buy something specific mm-hmm. to only one thing. Um, I try not to own too much stuff in general. Mm-hmm. So if I need a specific thing for you know my wrist or for my bike or something, I would rather have something that's going to have multiple applications. So like lacrosse ball, toe spreaders, and if you have feet, you already have all the hardware you're going to need. Perfect. I like the way you said that. Plus, I mean, it was something I learned at Foot Collective. I mean, you got your fingers. Stick those bad boys in the middle of your toes, and you're good to go. Toe spreaders instantly. Excellent it works point. Out. Um, so, you know, you explain a little bit about the foot, you know, going barefoot and whatnot. And the science of falling is all about, you know, balance and falling. And, you know, my mission is to make that gap from standing up to the floor. I mean, as physical mm. therapists, we show people when they – when they're standing up, how to be strong, how to be reactive so they can catch themselves and also have good balance. And we also teach people how to get off off the floor once they are on the ground. But we're missing that little key piece of what do you do when you're actually falling down? Um, and that's kind of the mission of the science falling. But the you know we also need to talk about the balance aspect too because I want to talk about everything involved in the falling process. So in terms of the foot, it's 
explain to me a little bit uh, what you would do with one of your clients if they had some balance issues and how you kind of go along that route of getting them back to having safe balance. Yeah. So balance is something that is, you know, involved naturally to a degree in most personal training programs. Mm -hmm. um, if you have your clients or patients doing unilateral lower body work, then there will be balance demands uh, placed on them like 100% of the time. But in my opinion, a lot of personal training programs really fail to adequately challenge a person's balance. And I think, you know, however you want to periodize for your client, whether it is with weight or with weekly running or walking mileage, usually we like to have a fair amount of challenge such that the stimulus will create a positive response. Mm -hmm. And I just don't think we do that with personal training or movement coaching enough. Um, I think we just feel like, well, you know, if you're increasing your strength with a lunge or with a single leg squat or a single leg, you know, Romanian deadlift, your balance is probably sufficient. Mm -hmm. But in my opinion, you need to continue climbing the balance mountain to a point where you're literally like a human gyroscope and you're just never going to fall or whatever those things are called that prevent things from tipping over. I, I got you. I got you. I got you. I love it. And so, uh, usually I'll add like if, if I have a new client, I'll ask them if they've ever done balance specific stuff. And their answer is usually yes, mm -hmm. but it usually falls short of what I would consider adequate. So they're probably not doing a lot of like single foot only hinging or squatting or lunging. And I'm not necessarily married to any movement specifically, but they need to be spending at least some of their time training on just one foot, even if it is just balancing. Um, usually the footwear will interfere with that. A lot of people mm -hmm. will come in for personal training sessions wearing running shoes with a thick sole with mm -hmm. a narrow toe box. And that is drastically going to reduce your ability to balance your body. Mm -hmm. So at that point we will begin the conversation of how I feel about footwear. But as I have been practicing more and more now, it is a more and more gentle approach to the conversation. Because, you know, when I first found out about it and like got a pair of Vivos and, you know, was doing balance beam stuff, it was like the first thing we would talk about. I'd be like, man, like footwear industry is terrible. The shoes you're wearing, like they're going to hurt you, I promise. Like, and people, you know, people don't react very uh, positively to that. Yeah. Uh, too, they too, might too, think you. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. I was going to say a little bit, a little bit too much sauce on there. A little too, too much it, aggression going in it, coming out. Yeah, like, exactly. And I think a lot of young practitioners who care have probably been guilty of that in some way. Um, but now it's like, okay, so how do you feel about your shoes? Like, how do your feet feel generally? And I just slowly start like painting this picture of how the natural human body is really perfect as it is. If you have natural toe splay and like a, a wider um, area that you're covering with your toes, your balance is just going to improve immediately from that. And then we can start to incorporate other proprioceptive challenges like closing your eyes. Um, we can eliminate sound or we can increase sound in the form of music or whatever. Um, and then obviously we can change the surface if we want to mm -hmm. use like a BOSU ball or a, a balance beam or something like that. Mm -hmm. But I find that at least for the first couple weeks or months, like a firm ground surface is going to be sufficient because people's balance is much lower than I would want as their standard level of balance. Mm -hmm. I, I find the, for my patients, because almost every single one of my patients, especially because I work with mainly older population, um, their balance is not good coming in. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's interesting because they have, their shoe does so much for them, which is I think mm -hmm. part of the reason why people like the shoes because it adds to their balance and stability because it's doing <clears throat> part of the work and contracting everything. Um, for them and I get them out of their shoes. I almost say I'm the same way. I always, every patient has any lower body issue. I'm like, all right, take the shoes off. We're working, you know, it. like it's become a normal thing where they take their shoes off and they come in and they're, my patients are the only ones, only ones doing that. None of my, mm -hmm. you know, coworkers are having their patients take their shoes off. And I find that their balance gets better so much faster when their shoes are off because now they're feeling the ground. I teach them about the, the tripod foot, you know, formation and just making sure they balance that and just having that cue being barefoot and telling them think about the tripod foot your three points of contact that gives you a good base of support 
people's balance gets better so much quicker. But because I'm in physical therapy, we do some lower level exercises. I try to, you know, bump people up. But in your practice, you're doing more dynamic movements on these legs, right? You know, like the single leg hinges and stuff like that, correct? It is, yeah, especially if people are coming in without injury or too much mm -hmm. injury. Um, and also if that's something that they really want to improve. Uh, a lot of the people who I had coming in for personal training were a little bit older. So preventing falls was a, an area of concern for them. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I had, it's funny, like most of my clients would either take their shoes off. A lot of my clients actually bought new shoes, oh, which nice. is not necessarily something I encourage with people because usually just taking off your shoes is sufficient. Um, but I had clients who had Vivos and uh, Ultras and even Vibram Five Fingers. And so it's, at least for me, and I think for other practitioners, it just, it's such low hanging fruit. Mm -hmm. Like we could be training in these uh, very sophisticated, proprioceptive, demanding ways. It's like, or you just take your shoes off and it's going to get better almost automatically. Mm -hmm. How much do you think the, because uh, you talked a little bit about earthing and grounding and stuff, and I think that's a different conversation one minute asked, but kind of in the same regard, how much is the sensory information you're getting in the foot through being barefoot really affecting the balance and our ability to be stable? Uh, it's, it's huge. It might be one of the biggest factors. Um, there are just tons of sensory nerves that are fed through the, the feet, and we – create multiple layers of interruptions with those nerves and whatever point they're trying to balance on. So you have a sock, then you have a shoe with a thick level of cushioning. And then mm -hmm. within that shoe is maybe an insole that is providing more. Uh, it's really, to me, it's just like a wiring interruption situation. Mm -hmm. And then you have the ground, like maybe if you're in a gym or something, you have turf. If you're on a firm surface, then, you know, at least that is, will give you, true feedback. Mm -hmm. um, but the more you can just peel the layers away, like if you just take your shoes off, that is going to immediately give you better sensory feedback. Mm -hmm. So that's where people should start. I'm always been curious, uh, especially once I got further into the, the foot rabbit hole, I guess you can call it. Yeah. Um, I've always been curious to see if there uh, probably there'll never be a study on this, but people's sensory nerves in their feet and their like neuroplasticity in their brain someone who's always worn shoes versus someone who's barefoot more and just, yeah. you know what I mean? Like how, how much are the nerves being affected? Cause I'm sure the brain, you know, in the area of the foot is not as developed as it could be not even close. Cause there's, you get a cushion all day practically. And the only time we walk barefoot is at home, probably in socks on carpet and maybe hardwood floor if we're lucky. I assume there's a strong connection. Like the more and more I read and learn and talk to people, like, Everything is connected. Mm -hmm. um, you know, most of the serotonin in your brain comes from your gut. Um, I just literally assume everything within the body and beyond is connected. And um, it actually gets me thinking about the centenarians, like the people who live to be 100 in the blue mm -hmm. zones and how in like Okinawa, Japan, they do a lot of manual labor. Mm -hmm. uh, they'll do a lot of like farming. And I think they do a lot of those practices in more traditional footwear or barefoot. And what's interesting about them specifically in that area is that one of the things that's been theorized is that because there are monsoons and storms that sweep the highly mineralized water onto the crops, that they are not only getting more minerals through their diet, but also they would be walking on mm. more richly mineralized soil. That's and like, super interesting. That's like, there's so many of those interesting things that are going on in the world as we're unaware in our current location or situation. And it's a shame that like, there won't be studies about those things. But um, mm -hmm. those, those things where like, there are perfect conditions are what keep me just constantly inspired to learn and read about more of what's going on. And it's interesting because there won't be studies on there, on those most likely if you were to say something like that to somebody who doesn't kind of have more of an open mind, they'd be like, mm, I don't think so. It doesn't make any sense. How would you absorb minerals and stuff through your feet? But it was interesting. I saw you post something on your Instagram the other day about earthing and grounding and whatnot. And at first glance, just the word earthing and grounding. Oh man, that sounds real hippie. It's woo woo, mm. but there's actually studies on it. And there's actually, I mean, there's, there's things out there that show this is actually changing the body. And it's as simple as just walking outside barefoot and like feeling the ground and, 
you know, what's the actual cause behind it? Is it, you know, magnetic fields or is it the minerals or whatever it might be? I think you'd probably know more about it than I do, but it's interesting. That it's, it's a real thing, but the minute you say earthing or grounding, people are going to say, no, we're good. Just dismiss it. Yeah, that's like another, you know, thing I'm trying to constantly work on being proficient at is how can I convey some of these things that will be considered woo-woo, like mm -hmm. walking barefoot or earthing. And I just think we have to... We have to have the information, be willing to share it. We have to be articulate. Um, and this is another, this is another part of it is like, yes, we talk about shoes looking cool and people being receptive to that is like, part of it is how do I appear? Like, how do I look to a client? Like, do I look like a hippie? If I do, then maybe they will be less likely to listen to me. Mm -hmm. So maybe that means I need to dress professionally, even though I want to, you know, wear whatever it is I want to mm -hmm. wear. Um, but if we can simplify it as well while remaining articulate and maybe having a study or two to reference, um, that is what I will do. And so the way I usually phrase it to people who are probably going to be less receptive, mm -hmm. uh, to unscientific information, whatever that means, um, is that humans are essentially the only animal that goes days or weeks or months without touching the physical earth. Mm -hmm. And there is so much simplicity in that statement, but I'm like, think about it. Like think about the deer out there and the birds and the squirrels and everything that you see that is living a natural life is interacting and touching the earth every day. And they don't have a lot of the modern human afflictions. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's brings you back to school. I think maybe two years ago. Anyway, I, I bought those maybe it was a year ago. I'm not sure. But about those shoes we were talking about before, beforehand, I want you to talk about your marathon, by the way. This is this is just the thought, mm -hmm. the barefoot marathon after this. But um, I bought those, you know, natural zero drop shoes, wider toe box and everything. And I was wearing them at the gym. And one of my uh, physical therapy classmates came up. He's like, bro, why are you wearing those? Like, it's you should actually be wearing like, you know, Reeboks or, you know, something a little mm -hmm. more athletic. And these are, mm -hmm. you know, off brand, you know, bought them for 20 bucks on Amazon. I love them. I still have them. But, you know, it was this whole thing. We got into this conversation about feet. It must have been after the Foot Collective, maybe, because I had a little more information when I was talking to him. Um, but yeah, we were talking about this, and he's like, no, that's not natural, man. I've been wearing shoes since I was a little kid. Why? Well, it's not natural for my feet to not wear shoes. Mm. So it's interesting that, I think, is that part of the stigma, do you think? People have been wearing shoes so long, and they're just talking about walking barefoot outside. It's just different than their actual life, and it's not, it's not normal for them, even though it's normal for the human body that's been around for you know hundreds of thousands of years, if not more. Yeah, I mean, I assume this gentleman you were talking to was like in his 20s or 30s. Yeah. And so it's going to be problematic if someone believes that what they have done for the last two or three decades is natural on like a historic human level. Mm -hmm. Because what we've done over the last 20 or 30 years is not natural. Like mm -hmm. very little of what we do is natural. So I guess we would need to consider how we can reframe the way young people and older people think about the term natural. Mm -hmm. uh, because all of nature is just all of what's happened on the earth and what's happened since humans have been here uh, has just been a very small fraction of that. And there have been great things and there have been terrible things and there have been neutral things and it's all been natural to a degree. Um, but yeah, just because something is familiar or has been normalized doesn't mean it's natural because a lot of terrible things are normalized and a lot of unnatural things mm -hmm like television watching or interacting with people over the phone um, or not going outside, you know, once throughout the course of a day, that is not normal in terms of human history, but it might be something that's been normalized for that human. Mm -hmm. and I think just something that popped in my brain in terms of, you know, not natural, but we think it's normal. I know there's been quite a few studies about nurses being in hospitals all day, you know, the helping mm -hmm. people, they're considered to be healthier because they're in the healthcare system. I think there was a study like 70 to 80% of nurses were vitamin D deficient and a lot of them showed depression because they were never outside. They never saw the world they never got the sunshine and it caused so many issues because I mean, depression just leads to other issues. Um, and so these people that we need to be looking up to, to be healthcare workers, you know, they have to be the pinnacle of health. Their, their lives aren't even natural because we've been forced into so many unnatural situations. So how do we, in terms of footwear, how do we go from this unnatural, you know, cushioned foot that's very restrictive and grade down to a zero drop shoe or more barefoot stuff? Cause it's kind of like weightlifting or weight training, right? 
we can't just go from one end to the spectrum to the other because I mean, we're not going to go into the gym and bench press 300 pounds without destroying ourselves either. Yeah. Um, you know, it's like the simple answer is always like do things progressively, take your time, like have, you know, have, have maybe milestones or markers that you want to hit before you, you move to another, uh, area or, or something that's more challenging or mm -hmm. uh, more natural in, in the, in the form of footwear. Um, but what's cool about footwear is that you can go right into the most natural form of footwear on day one. You just will not be able to do much in terms of volume of, of running or training that will take time. Mm -hmm. So I think that's empowering to people because you don't need to delay your transition to natural footwear, but you will need to progressively, uh, use that footwear for more demanding tasks. So let's say you are a marathon runner that does some cross training in the gym two or three times a week. Like I would just want that person walking in a pair of natural shoes. Mm -hmm. um, maybe if, if they're work appropriate, wear them to work. If they are not, wear them, you know, doing some walking. That's kind of another issue. A lot of people don't do much walking throughout the yes. day. Ideally we should do, you know, at a minimum like 10 or 15 minutes walking, but mm -hmm. let's, just say everyone's walking for 15 minutes, use those shoes for your walking and then slowly maybe start, you know, see how four or five minutes of jogging in them feels or mm -hmm. see how one minute of jogging them feels. And then as you feel like you're like, you'll notice, you'll notice changes in your feet. You'll notice changes in your calf, your, your calves, um, your hips and your back will, and your core will probably start to feel a little bit different. Mm -hmm. um, but the physical form of your foot will probably look a little bit different as well. So as those become more pronounced, then you can consider doing more running, doing some lifting. Personally, I feel like a lot of lifting is safe in natural footwear, mm -hmm. um, but there's going to be ranges of motion at the ankle and the knees and the hips that are probably going to take a little bit of time to increase to natural, um, natural levels. Mm -hmm. So do it progressively. Start with walking. Start with just very basic recreation or working if they're work appropriate. And then... Um, as you're seeing these structural changes and you're feeling these strength or stability changes, slowly start adding them in. Um, mm -hmm. it, it is an interesting issue because people will feel the difference quickly and they'll become enthusiastic. And this is something like I've had clients experience and people message me on Instagram. They're like, Hey, I'm so excited about running in my, my five fingers. Like what, like, can I just jump in? And I'm like, just start with walking you know, see how it feels. And then I get people that are like, Hey, I ran a mile. It felt really good. And I'm like, that's great. Continue mm -hmm. taking your time. And then at some point they'll like, Oh, I ran three miles. And like, now I've injured something in my foot. So it definitely does take time, but if you can really just delay, you know, adding everything to your life in the natural footwear, um, chances are you're going to be able to totally avoid injury. And then you'll be able to do everything in mm -hmm. the natural footwear. And it's really interesting because um, I, I think that's maybe another hang up of people. They say, well, I'm doing all this stuff in this footwear I'm wearing now, but then I go to natural mm. footwear or barefoot, I end up hurting myself much quicker. And I think people forget that their feet are detrained, basically. They, I mean, they're, they've been stabilized and held by uh, unnatural arch supports for so long that it's going to take time, but they just, they don't want to wait and that's i don't think that's a selfish thing on their part i think it's just a misunderstanding of that foot's not ready for it it's you've been helped out for so long from this these shoes and you never actually trained them so it's going to take long you have to you know keep that in mind i do think that is something culturally that everyone would benefit from if it changed a little bit in that people you know they establish some level of performance like okay i've run a half marathon I am now a half marathon runner. Like that becomes part of our identity. Mm -hmm. And so now any run that I do that is not a half marathon is inferior to that. Mm -hmm. And that is something that really needs to change because one of the things that Jeff, the urban barefoot talks about is anything that you do performance wise from a physical standpoint in unnatural footwear is not a true reflection of your capabilities. Mm -hmm. So if you can run a full marathon in less than three hours in a crazy pair of whatever shoes with a carbon plate with a crazy heel drop like yes you've you've achieved that but that is not an honest reflection of mm -hmm. your natural human capabilities and so if you could just get over that 
you would be open to so many cool possibilities because mm -hmm. maybe now a barefoot 5k is not going to feel less like a loss. It's going to feel more like a new opportunity and you've, you know, you've strengthened your body in this new way and you've challenged your brain in this new way. And ultimately I do think it will lead to greater performances or better, you know, maybe more optimal performances. Mm -hmm. But in our, I think as Americans or as Westerners, we just have these levels that we're like, well, you know, I have benched 300 pounds. If I'm not benching 300, like I, I failed. Mm -hmm. It's like, no, there's so much stuff and like the body and the, the nervous system changes all the time. Like we need to get over that. And so I'm trying, that's like a, that's like a big thing. I'm trying to figure out how I can help people understand. And it's hard because um, you're going against human psychology and, you know, even though it's only been maybe 50 years of this kind of stuff, it's still 50 years of people, you know, our age under 50 who that's mm -hmm. all they know. Right. Mm -hmm. That's all they've ever seen in their life. So let's talk about your your barefoot half marathon since we're talking about half marathon running i mean i is that you know you talk a little bit about i guess the first question is is that the pinnacle of your achievements barefoot because that's pretty insane to me in a cool pinnacle way pinnacle of my barefoot achievements i mean i i suppose it is by definition mm -hmm. um i haven't really done that much barefoot um in, in other ways, the pinnacle of my barefoot performance is that I elect to do everything at home barefoot, mm -hmm. and I often walk around the town I live in barefoot. Like, it would be easy to say, like, yes, that's the pinnacle. That's the furthest I've run. But what's more important is the fact that I go barefoot more often. And so I'm healthier because of that. Mm -hmm. I am showing my townspeople that there is another way to walk around. And I've created a habit or a behavior in myself that will not lead to injury unless I like step on a nail or something. Mm -hmm. um, so in some ways that's, that's more important, but yes, the half marathon was certainly, certainly the longest distance I've run. It was a really great example of something that I wasn't sure if I'd be able to finish in my life and running for me has become in some ways like very mystical or spiritual more mm -hmm. so than just being physical. And so when you do something barefoot, it's such a natural way of doing things. It like brings us back to tapping into what our ancestors would have done. It was certainly the most spiritual, physical thing I've ever done. That, I mean, like I said, before we started podcast, it kind of blew my mind. I was like, man, that is cool. Um, explain to the listeners kind of your progression from, I guess this, is, this might take you back a little bit too far, but from wearing normal shoes to getting to this maybe not the pinnacle of your barefoot, but the, the sports performance pinnacle of barefoot, you know, going from not wearing anything, doing anything barefoot to now I just ran a freaking half marathon, which most people can't even complete in normal shoes. Yeah. yeah. Um, and it's, it's, it's definitely a long story, but I'm going to see what I can, if I can make it efficient. <laughs> so I got into training because in high school and before that I was obese, mm -hmm. I was severely overweight. I had ingrown toenails. I was in a little bit of pain. I wasn't very confident. And I started exercising. I always wanted to get into running, but I was always heel striking in a conventional shoe mm -hmm. and it just felt really unnatural. And I read Born to Run uh, in high school, like when it first came out. And I was so inspired that I ran a couple miles barefoot and I probably came very close to devastatingly injuring my feet and ankles. I couldn't really walk correctly for about a week or, you know, efficiently. And so I took a break from that until the end of college when I got those New Balance shoes mm -hmm. and then I started training in natural footwear and I never really revisited running until, uh, I guess it was like the fall of last year, not like 2019, but like the fall or the fall of 2018, spring mm -hmm. of 2019. And I pretty much at that point only owned uh, natural footwear. So mm -hmm. Vivo barefoot shoes. Um, I have just like some water shoes I got on, on Amazon. And so I started running. I made sure to only be heel striking. I was also incorporating things like uh, strictly nasal breathing. And I found that my endurance increased so much more rapidly than it ever had. And mm -hmm. relatively quickly within a, a couple of weeks, uh, maybe a couple of months, I could run four or five miles, which was the longest I could ever run. And then August of last year, almost a year ago, I ran my first half marathon up in uh, Kenny Bunkport, actually, mm -hmm. up in Maine. Yeah, I love it. Uh, on the trails, which was really cool. Mm -hmm. And then after that, um, you know, we kind of 
fall passed and then we settled into the new England winter and my buddy Jeff, who I keep talking about invited me down to Miami to do the half marathon with him. And mm-hmm. I was like, I was nervous. I, I was pretty confident I could finish it, but I was brought back to my initial trial of barefoot running. And I mm-hmm. thought I was going to potentially injure myself. So I did a little bit of training. I got up to like six or seven or eight miles in shoes outdoors. And then I went and we did it and we were successful. We finished. But, which is so crazy because I mean, you didn't really train for it barefoot and you did it barefoot and tell, tell the listeners a little bit about your, your injuries quote unquote that you sustained because they yeah. really weren't that bad for what you, you would expect from running an entire half marathon barefoot. No. Um, and what's interesting about barefoot running, I'll preface my injuries with this is that when you strip away as much um, what I call sensory deprivation from running, the experience becomes much more efficient. So when I think of a traditional, like a runner, I would see out wherever they're wearing sunglasses, they're listening to music, maybe with noise canceling, they're wearing a hat, they're wearing shoes with thick soles, they're not talking to anybody, like they're literally engaging in sensory deprivation. Mm -hmm. And the worst form of this would be on a treadmill inside. So now you're engaging with no one and no nature at all. Whereas when you're barefoot, no music, you know, maybe sunglasses, but like no glasses, nothing really interfering with your vision. Uh, talking with one of your friends, two of your friends actually, because another foot nerd ran it with us or three of us total. Um, It's the, it's, you're just present in the moment the entire time. So I can Mm -hmm. remember like stepping over pieces of glass and nails that I would not have seen if I wasn't fully present in the moment. Mm -hmm. And so I like, I'm aware of my movement. I'm aware of avoiding hazards and things like that. So my only injuries really were, excessively sore muscles in my ankles um nothing you know no ankle joint or bone injuries no knee Mm -hmm. injuries no pain in the hips the back the core just muscle just just pain in the muscles that were stabilizing me over the course of those 13.1 miles and that's after no barefoot training practically maybe a little bit but no barefoot training um not even a lot of outdoor running uh, through, you know, December and January. Mm -hmm. And I did have a blister on my left foot, but it was just a pretty basic blister that I think the average person could get from walking around a city in shoes. Yeah. And I mean, if you think about running a half marathon, so many miles and just that friction anyway, between the shoe and your foot, it's probably going to happen. They'll probably have a couple of blisters. I just think that's so awesome, I guess, because it really, it takes everything we've talked about already. And now it's a practical application of like, all right, I'm not just talking this stuff. I'm actually living it. I'm doing it. And I didn't even have to prep, you know, very specifically for this barefoot event. You weren't like saying, I got to do everything barefoot just to get my feet calloused up and ready. I mean, it's all about just the sensory and you're, you're paying attention to what you're doing. I'm sure you were foot striking a little bit softer just because you're barefoot. Um, and I'm sure the ground was a little bit hot for you at the same time, but probably. Yeah, it was, it was, uh, the ground, like the ground was so, um, diverse from place to place because we started pretty early we started like a little bit before 6 Mm a.m so it was still pretty cool but then like at one point we crossed over a bridge and then at another point we like ran past a golf course so we had some grass to run on Mm -hmm. and then we figured out that by running on the painted line that was easier on our feet than running on the black tar oh yeah so there was a lot of like interesting dynamic problem solving going on throughout the whole thing which is so interesting because I think most people just zone out during a half marathon and you can't zone out when you're running barefoot because you have to be very present or else bad things can happen. I think a lot of people zone, try to zone out during running specifically because they mm-hmm. don't want to think about the discomfort they're going to feel. Mm-hmm. And I think that is a big reason why so many runners get injured is because they're not paying attention. Mm-hmm. It's so interesting, man. Well, let's end it right there because I love the just the dynamic of here's an actual real situation where you're taking everything you've been talking about put to use and it's i mean it's so interesting to see where you started at you know as a young younger a little obese i mean that's my story too that's how i got into fitness you get obese and your confidence isn't there mm-hmm. and all of a sudden you're like all right, i gotta do something you build it up and then that selfish need for you know outside validity from everybody because you lose the weight turns into a passion and then it finds you in this weird place where all of a sudden you're a foot nerd and you're spreading the knowledge of, you know, barefoot stuff and living a healthy lifestyle. I think it's so interesting. I love it. I absolutely love it. You have anything uh, else you want to, you want to 
throw out there? Any other ideas you're thinking of? Or? Um, let's see, some ideas. I mean, I think what people, you know, what I, what I would want them to take away is that I'm not necessarily advocating to, like, go barefoot, um, do this amount of balance work, and, you know, have, have strict things that you are making yourself do. Like, all I'm advocating for is for people to try to do things more naturally. Mm -hmm. So it just so happens that the footwear thing means be barefoot more often and be in more natural footwear. But in other ways, it means spend more face to face time with the people you love, spend more time outside, um, you know, read more books, mm -hmm. uh, you know, don't spend as much time in front of a television. Um, you know, if you're try to spend more time in a deep squat position barefoot, because that's mm -hmm. the natural human resting position, eat more natural foods. Like just, if we can do everything more naturally, we're going to have less disease and we're going to have less afflictions and we're going to need less surgery and pharmaceutical drugs mm -hmm. and we'll be able to sustain our health more efficiently. I just, you know, we just so happen to meet through the foot thing. Yeah. But I think you and I are both, advocating for people to follow more holistic health and life practices. Definitely. Um, I would encourage people to check out the foot collective if they are having foot afflictions. Mm -hmm. um, they have a website. There's an app you can download the TFC app. Uh, you can find them on Instagram and Nick and the others are constantly throwing out awesome information. That's very easy, low hanging fruit. Usually um, I am uh, an ambassador for a company called head sweats. Mm -hmm. They make, hats and they make uh, performance apparel. Uh, what I like most about them is that they are making shirts out of material called Reprieve, which awesome. are threads made from recycled bottles, plastic bottles. Oh, that's cool. So that's actually another thing I th is a big driver for me is to make more uh, sustainable footwear and clothing. And, you know, if we can make our health practices more sustainable, that's, mm -hmm. that's another conversation, but that's a big part of what I do is trying to make things more sustainable. People should be buying less things. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a company I work with that actually makes things more sustainably. So if you use a code I have, it's my last name, Paisani, P-I-S-A-N-I 35, you can get 35% off for their hats and clothes and stuff. So awesome. check them out. I mean, I'm on Instagram. I'm not really using social media as much these days, mm -hmm. but uh, across most of the platforms, you can find me at Solemn Strength. Awesome. Yeah, I'll put all that stuff in the show notes as well to make sure everybody has a, a link to you or the head sweats and figure that stuff out. Um, I really appreciate you being here. I love the, the ending message of, I mean, I'm going to try to encompass it into a single sentence, but just be a little more human and be aware of what you're doing, right? I mean, just try to is that. Yep, just try to be one with what's going on around you. I love it. And I exactly so much good information in this podcast. I'm going to have to listen to it again and try to pick up some more little tidbits there. Um, I appreciate you, man. Thank you so much. I appreciate you, Brent. Thank you for being, being a practitioner who is literally like living the message and is trying to find information that's just going to help your patients. So we need more practitioners like you. So thank you for kind of leading the way in your own way. So grateful, man. I appreciate you. All right. I'll see you later. See you, man.